Senator Riggs, thanks for joining me. I wanted to talk to you today about Senate Bill 1327, which came from the uh, Idaho Behavioral Health Council. Thanks for uh, being here. Thanks for having me. Sure. So. Uh, can you walk me through uh, what Senate Bill 1327 does? I saw on the Senate floor the other day, uh, you mentioned days like this make me proud to be a member of this body. Uh, what would Senate Bill 1327 do for Idahoans? Well, and I think but to, to tell how 1327 is gonna affect people, we first have to talk about what House Bill 316 was from last year, which was the with the Medicaid expansion into Idaho, there was going to be some overlap in what our indigent fund and catastrophic fund were doing for uh, people in Idaho that needed their support, that now a lot of those people were being transitioned to Medicaid. So there was a plan to eventually kind of phase out the indigent fund and the catastrophic fund, um, but uh, there was a lot of moving pieces and complexity, and we weren't quite sure how to deal with that. So um, I started working with people that had specific uh, ownership of parts of how this was gonna be affected uh, last year to kind of get parties together and understand how, um, how this was gonna be done. And so we knew that there were going to be some additional pieces of legislation that we're gonna need to patch some soft spots that we knew that uh, 316 uh, wasn't going to take care of. And that, that was part of what made me really proud about 1327 is that, um, there was a lot of trust put in by different parties that didn't necessarily have reason to trust each other because this is just the political world and things go sideways. And so it wasn't uh, a, a lack of trust out of any sort of malicious intent, but just people get scared that they might not get what they need. Um, and so the, the courage that everyone showed of, of kind of walking this path together, uh, it was evident in 316 and now in 1327, coming back together with all of these uh, these different groups, these stakeholders to say, let's make sure that we have people covered. And that was one of the big issues that, that developed was while we were looking at the way um, our hospitals and our people and the services were being handled, it became very clear that there was no real differentiation between uh, things you would go to a hospital for. So if you were treated for a broken bone or, or a sore throat, it's the same as uh, an, a, a psychotic episode, an, an, any sort of uh, mental disorder that needed treatment. And w as we all know, those are just very different things. So we, it became clear to us that we kind of needed to create some separation from traditional illness and injury versus mental issues that need to be handled. And the same goes with uh, you know more urban focused uh, hospitals and then rural uh, critical care access hospitals and saying we can't treat those the same either. So. Our, our normal system became kind of segmented, segmented in that way. And so it became important for us to figure out how to uh, make sure that we were doing what we needed to do from our, our state obligation uh, to care for the people that needed, uh, especially the involuntary mental holds, uh, the, the civil commits as they're called. They, um, they, we've basically taken this a person and we've detained them uh, because they're having a mental uh, episode and they need to be uh, cared for and this is this is vastly different than somebody who just gets into an accident and so we had to kind of look at the, the way we were doing things and we found we were we were deficient in some of those areas we can do better and that's a lot of what uh, 1327 does to help clean up that uh, those issues and make it uh, better for everyone that that is both uh, being treated and doing the treatment Sure. The civil, the civil commitments apply to folks that are uh, so acutely ill that perhaps they cannot make uh, their own medical decisions. Um, there is some uh, shift in financial responsibility with this legislation from the county to the state. Can you walk me through uh, what that'll mean for the county budgets? Absolutely. Um, the, the biggest part of the, the financial shift uh, away from the counties into the state was based around this idea that we are basically, from a statutory standpoint, we're saying that uh, somebody that gets placed on a commitment like that, they have to, they're basically being held by the state to be assessed and you know, what kind of treatment uh, they're gonna undergo is, uh, is something that gets determined there. And that's where we said, well, if, if we have the obligation from the state level to make sure that uh, our citizenry 
are cared for and protected. And some of these, some of this language is um, is kind of in the in the Idaho Constitution, saying that for the general welfare of the people, the state is responsible for these types of things. And so it started to become clear to us that this really shouldn't be a county financial obligation also because the with the lack of funding from the indigent fund and the catastrophic fund going forward mm -hmm. we said this is this really will be needs to be the responsible the responsibility of the state and that was part of the pieces of uh, trust that I alluded to earlier is that there the hospitals were going to be on the hook for all of these costs if we didn't uh, take care of uh, 1327 and get these things filled and that's where the hospitals really stepped up to say if if this doesn't get fixed, we're going to be on the hook for a lot of these costs, which to some of the larger hospitals would be uh, frustrating, but not uh, you know just uh, destructive. But the, there are a lot of rural uh, critical care access hospitals that this would be this would close their doors, and so that's the the leap of faith that everybody took to get there. I think was was important, and so we from the state felt we needed to, to make sure we did the right thing of taking care of the funding back at the state level for these people that are on these uh, involuntary mental holds. Uh, this morning in House Health and Welfare Committee, Ross Edmonds with Division of Behavioral Health spoke, um, and he mentioned that um, another aspect of the bill is the post-commitment transport, uh, which he felt would um, bring back some of the humanity of it. Of course, when the county was doing post-commitment transport, those folks would often be uh, transported in a police vehicle in which they had to be shackled and handcuffed. Um, it's my understanding that now th those folks, should the bill uh, pass, would be transported in uh, some sort of secure vehicle from the state rather than a police vehicle. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. And that's, that, that's kind of the uh, inherent difficulty that comes with, uh, with helping people with, that are going through this type of situation. When, when somebody has um, a public uh, mental health episode, a lot of times it leads to some sort of disturbance of the peace, uh, some sort of uh, other related crime. And so the tendency has always been, well, that you get put in a police car then. And so it goes the same with, okay, they're kind of in police custody even while at uh, a facility for assessment, treatment, et cetera. So if they're going to be moved somewhere else, then the police will continue that kind of chain of custody to take them to the next place. And this is, this is just kind of further um, showing with 1327 how we're changing the way that we're, we're seeing some of these issues and how we're dealing with them, knowing that when somebody goes through a, a situation like that, there's likely going to be some not necessarily legal but behavior that comes from it that's completely outside of their control. So we don't, let's not penalize them from a criminal standpoint, let's make sure that they get the help they need. And a lot of times the, you know, being um, handcuffed and put in a police car can exacerbate these situations, making recovery even harder, uh, therefore longer, costing more money and all of those things. So this is just part of that collaborative effort to say, let's make sure that, that we care for these people, we transport them in a humane way, making sure that, um, that they're not, we're not putting undue burden on their already uh, fragile mental state. Great. I appreciate your time today. That bill now heads before the House floor for a debate, but until then, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Senator. It was Senator my Rice. pleasure.